Hello and welcome to another date with the Dream Alchemist. My name is Karen Asampa and today we have Mark Colburn, MBE, Paralympic champion with us today, a guy who I saw speak about three weeks ago now, who when I heard his story I just thought, wow, I have to have him on a date with the Dream Alchemist. So much inspiration and I know he can do so much for the people. So Mark, welcome, thank you very much. Hi Karen, how are you? I'm fantastic in yourself. Yeah, very good, thank you. So I don't want to keep people waiting, so if we get straight into it, Mark, and just tell us a little bit about how your story began. I guess my, my story um, originally started probably, well, probably over 30 years ago, when my childhood dream was to one day hopefully become maybe an Olympic champion, which I suppose most kids tend to have that kind of dream. Mm. Uh, and that dream literally stayed with me, you know, all my life. Um, right through into my 30s and then literally up to the, the year that I was actually 40 years of age when I was actually a, a keen rock climber. Um, I competed in triathlons on a regular basis and one of my one of my strongest passions was actually paragliding. And for me, you know, being part of a, a great uh, paragliding school in South Wales, um, we were actually flying in May 2009 uh, just over the Gower Peninsula, above a, an amazing, beautiful part of South Wales called Rossilly. And it's a beautiful beach. It's three miles long, so it's perfect, you know, for, for paragliding. And and as I said, all these dreams and aspirations of, uh, of being an Olympic champion, you know, and the other dream of, of sort of the Peter Pan moment, um, as we call it, um, it, it all sort of came to fruition, you know. And unfortunately, that afternoon, um, while I was literally living the dream, my canopy unfortunately collapsed. And while I was 40 feet above the ground with no canopy above me, you can imagine, it was only one way I was going, and that was straight down. And in, that, in that moment, you don't mind me asking, how did you feel in that moment? Did you, what, what was the feeling in that moment? I think the, the memory that I've got, you know, was just uh, at a shock. You know, when you see something happening before your eyes and people talk about this slow motion, you know, and that two seconds that it took me to literally hit the floor felt like sort of like 10 seconds. I could see the ground, you know, coming up and naturally there's nothing you can do other than just, you know, brace yourself for that uh, that impact. And, and well, luckily, <laughs> luckily I did actually land on my feet because you can imagine if I'd landed on my backside from 40 feet above, above the ground, the pressure would have gone up through my spine and probably just killed me instantly, you yeah. know. Yeah. So that two seconds of just shock and fear, seeing the ground coming up at a rate of knots and then actually hitting the floor, and just being fully conscious, you know, which was, which was quite unreal in itself. And then to add insult to injury, the canopy actually reinflated, um, fully reinflated, and dragged me for almost almost the length of a football field, at sort of twenty twenty odd miles an hour. It was just, you know, it was just an, an horrendous feeling of being fully conscious and being dragged at this rate of knots. You know, just literally tumbling like a, a rag doll in a washing machine, you know, it was... Uh, had, it, had it just have got stuck while you were in the air? Is that what had happened? No, unfortunately, when um, I flew into what they call a crosswind, which is two airstreams fighting for the same space over the ridge where I was actually flying, and as I turned at 90 degrees to fly, you know, almost into the, the wind, my canopy just literally collapsed. Um, you know, the both, sort of both ends of the, the canopy just came down. And, uh, well, with nothing above you, there's only one way you're going to go. So, you know, some, you know, for me, it was just something just in the wrong place at the wrong time, I guess. You know, and I suppose we love this word hindsight, you know, that accidents do happen. And, you know, it was literally the decision I'd made at five o'clock that afternoon to go back up for the last sort of one hour. Um, and, you know, I've just got to live with that decision now for the rest of my life, I guess, you know. Mm. So what happened from there, Mark? Well, as, <clears throat> as I said, when the, the canopy reinflated and I obviously got dragged and literally got smashed to the ground for almost 100 metres, 
until it finally deflated and stopped. And I can, you know, solely remember just lying on the floor, looking up at the blue sky because it was a glorious, beautiful day. And just thinking to myself, well, that was, that was really close. <laughs> yeah. You know, it was really close to have this near fatal crash and still be alive. You know, literally still be alive to open my eyes and think, wow, I can't believe I'm still alive after that until I tried to sit up. Yeah. And then realized that, you know, I was completely paralyzed from my waist down. Um, couldn't get my shoulders off the floor. And immediately then, you know, knew that I'd done something serious. And as I looked down my body, I could see both my legs were severely twisted. And my first thought was, oh, my gosh, I I've broke both my legs, you know. And yet there was no pain. That's the, that's the surreal, strange part of it. You know, there was no pain. So I didn't panic. You know, immediately the, there's no pain but no movement, so I didn't panic. And uh, one of the paragliding pilots who saw me crash came down to my rescue and immediately, you know, radioed for the, the air ambulance. And they arrived, thankfully, within probably less than 15 minutes and started to stabilize me, you know, with morphine and obviously a, a neck collar, you know, carefully placed me on the spinal board then ready to airlift me off to the hospital and all this hap all this happened literally within from start to finish 50 minutes you know because the air ambulance have a process called the golden hour and when you have a near fatal accident you know they need to get you to medical support you know in hospital within that one hour so i was very lucky that the wales air ambulance were just superb absolutely superb on that day you know they really were as you as you've told me that part of your story, Mark, my whole my mouth was just like this the whole time because I can't believe, like you said, you had no pain. I can't imagine that journey from when you've landed and thought, "Oh my gosh," and then being dragged at twenty miles an hour along the ground. I can't imagine what that must have been like for you. The, so, the, human, the, the human body is is obviously an amazing machine, you know, yeah. fantastic, amazing machine that that it has these. Um, I suppose placements in your brain that when you have a, a really serious accident that it actually emulsifies the nerves that go up to your brain so the brain doesn't feel any of these pain you know receptors that's obviously traveling up your spinal cord and and it was quite a surreal moment you know to be lying on the floor in no pain with no movement literally mm -hmm. not being able to move my legs or turn over into the recovery position which is what I tried to do and it was quite surreal you know, it was quite surreal. And it wasn't until I got to hospital and had my x-rays and my, my MRI scans. And, you know, that's when, you know, the doctor had sort of told me that evening that unfortunately I'd broken my back. And even at that point, I, I didn't react. You know, I didn't react. It was just these thoughts of, well, I'll, I'll probably recover. You know, I'm really fit. I'm really strong. And, I, and I'll probably recover. And then it's not until you see the x-ray that you suddenly then realize, you know, how serious, you know, this accident actually was. Mm -hmm. And then everything starts to sort of take place in your mind then around, you know, will I ever walk again? You know, will I be, you know, sort of, I don't know, bound to a wheelchair or, or even worse, will I be in hospital for the rest of my life? Mm -hmm. you know, and those were the fears, you know, and, and really, really scary thoughts that, that was running through my mind that evening, you know. Oh wow! So after this, you stay in hospital, and then and then what happened? What happened next? Well, I spent um, I spent literally ninety four days on my back, completely paralysed, and and there were some very low times, you know, some very low times where there was times where I said to my parents at the time, you know, I, I can't continue doing this, you know, and I felt I've I've always been a tough cookie, but yeah. it, it it almost got the better of me, and my dad, God love him. You know, he always told me all my life that if you have a dream in life, whatever that dream is, never give up. Never give up until one day in the future, you know, your eyes will close for good. And that's just the, the phenomenon of life. You know, we can't stop it. Yeah. Um, we can slow it down. You know, we can slow the aging process down. However, we can't stop, you know, the process of living and then passing away. So I had these thoughts and these feelings, you know, right through hospital. And I kept thinking, well how the hell can I have any kind of dream now that I've left myself in this terrible state of disability for the rest of my life? Because 
I've damaged my hamstrings, my, my glutes or my bum muscles, and I've got drop foot now in both feet. So literally after starting to, you know, learn to walk again in hospital with a walking frame, and then finally, you know, finding out and identifying my quads and my hip flexors weren't affected, the physio in hospital actually placed me onto a static bike in, in the gymnasium. They bandaged my feet to the pedals, and I just started to cycle just as, as part of my rehabilitation. And, and when I left hospital after six months, it's quite a funny story. Mr. Inman, who was my consultant, said to me, good luck for the future, Mark, you know, but just be prepared that you know, your sport in life may never, ever be the same again. Because he knew that I was a keen rock climber and triathlete and you know, paragliding pilot. So, so I hope Mr. Inman was watching the London Paralympics. <laughs> <laughs> I was. <laughs> so yeah, so I, obviously I left hospital. I didn't go back to work. Um, you know, it was my choice to start to get fit and healthy again and get strong before I could take myself back into society. Yeah. Let me stop you at that moment. You mentioned when you were on your when you were on your back in bed and you were laid up for ninety four days. When you were facing your challenges and some some days you really felt like giving up. What got you? I know you, you, your father, you know, was fantastic with you. But what was it that we'd say deep inside that got you through those really challenging situations? Because I can't even imagine um, what it must be like. Because I get, you know, cramps or something like that, and I think I, I'm out of the game. So I can't imagine what that must have been like for you. What What was it that got you through those moments? I know you said your father saying about if you've got a dream. Yeah. But that inside, when did it, you know, what did it feel like for you that made you think, right, okay, I'll take another day, I'll take another day? I think, um, I think in the very beginning, obviously, you go through this process, you know, the five stages of, of grieving almost, you know, where, where you think in the beginning, why me? You know, why didn't it happen to somebody else? Not that I would ever wish that on anybody. And then it's, you start to accept it. You start to accept that what's happened, you can't change, you know. And it took me easily two months you know to start to accept what had happened and then just thinking well maybe I should give myself six months you know before I can start to even think about you know maybe walking or or, or even any kind of future so you're literally in the lap of the gods you know and you have to wait you have to be patient and and you tend to find places in your in your personality that you never thought were there you know, about being humble, you know, yeah. certainly being, being kind, but being kind to yourself and just being patient. Because if you think of the human body, the human body is not an iPad or an iPhone where you press a button and something happens. It takes weeks and months and sometimes even years, you know, for the human body to recover. So I think there was times, certainly in hospital, where I almost gave up. You know, I was almost on that last last 1% of just thinking, I, I can't continue with this, you know. It's almost like when you have really bad weather and one day rolls into the next and the next and the next and it just keeps going and going and after two months of rain, you suddenly think, oh, come on, you know, let's have some sunshine, you know. Mm -hmm. and, and I think the moment that the hospital staff hoisted me out of bed after 94, 95 days, and then they placed me into that wheelchair and they stood me up for the first time. That was almost another form of medicine for me because it was just that little small one step, you know, forward into the future. And, and then, as I said, doing my cycling in hospital, just rehabilitation, and then coming out of hospital. And what I found, Karen, was this, that every time I stepped onto that bike, you know, my, my father and my friends would help me onto my bike, flip me in my cycling shoes, you know, clip me into the pedals. And every time that I started to cycle, you know, using my quads, I didn't feel disabled. It mm. was quite, it was quite a, a strange feeling, but I didn't feel disabled. So what I found was I wanted to do that every day. You know, I was happy to put up with this disability for a few hours and then step onto my bike and just have that feeling of freedom, you know, that, that it gave me. So that was my journey for the, for the next six months, was literally just cycling every day, going to the gym, getting fit, getting strong again. And, and, and then, just out of the blue, I had a phone call from the Wales Air Ambulance who treated me and asked me if I wanted to take part in a charity cycle ride around Wales. And I said, I'm in. 
I, I want I want to give something back. You know, I had no money, I had no job, I was disabled, I was divorced. You know, life was great. Yeah. <laughs> so a big party for me. <laughs> I, was oh. just wanted, I just wanted to give something back. You know. And I remember Ross Griffin, the guy who called me, who was the paramedic who treated me on the day of my crash. And Ross said to me, we'd love to have you there, Mark. We see on Facebook you're cycling every day. You're doing really well. You know, This is one year after my crash. And Ross said, just to let you know, it's 523 miles in a week. I was like this. <laughs> I was like, oh, my gosh, what have I let myself in for, you know? But Karen, truthfully... I still say to this day, everything that's happened after my crash has happened for a reason, okay? I joined the, it was called Cycle Challenge Wales. The first day was Cardiff to Landrid, Nord Wales, 84 miles over the Brecon Beacons with all these celebrities, you know, rugby stars and athletic guys and just great people that were there on the day, you know? Mm -hmm. And at the end of the first day, one of the guys said to me, what's wrong with your legs? So I explained that, obviously, I'd broken my back. And uh, and he said to me, uh, can I ask you a question? I said, yeah, of course. He said, um, have you enjoyed today? I said, yeah, it's been brilliant. I can't wait to do the rest of the week, you know. And he said, what do you mean? I said, well, I'm doing the whole 523 miles to raise money for the air ambulance. And he said, oh, right. Um, well, I've got an apology for you then. I said, what's the apology? He said, well, this morning when I saw you, you know, rack up on your crutches, I genuinely thought you was one of the volunteers that was just going to hand out the teas and coffee, you know, and the sandwiches. Mm. So I never expected you to finish the whole day, you know, and I certainly didn't expect you to say that you were doing the whole week. I said, why do you ask? He said, well, I've been chasing your backside all day and I couldn't catch you. <laughs> <laughs> it, was at that moment, it was at that moment. I said to this gentleman, I said, do you mind if I ask who you are? And he said, my name is Dr. Ben Matthews. I'm a chiropractor from Cardiff. So I understand what's going on in your body, you know. So he said, um, can I ask you another question? I said, yeah, of course. He said, are you, um, are you training for the London Paralympics? I said, no, why? Why do you ask? He said, I think you should. And it wow. was, truthfully, it was the 10th of June, 2010. The light bulb moment went off, and I just thought, oh, my gosh, I've been waiting for this call in all my life. I've now got an opportunity, albeit with a disability, to train every day, focus on this goal, you know, with obviously my coach at the time, Neil Smith, from Disability Sport Wales. And I just thought, I've got to do this. I've got to do this. This is the door that's open for me, you know. Yeah. So I did the whole week carried on, raised a load of money for the Wales Air Ambulance. And I remember walking into my parents' house, because I was living with my parents, and, uh, and saying to my dad, I, I'm going to start training for the London Paralympics, you know, which is two years away. And he took one look at me, <laughs> and I'll never forget. And he said, Mark, now, you're 41 years of age. Now, come on, okay? I think your priorities are wrong. Why don't you just go back to work and forget this... This Olympic dream of yours, you know? Oh, I, wow. I said, Dad, please don't take this the wrong way. I've got to do this because you drummed into me all my life. You know, mm -hmm. if you have a dream in life, whatever that dream is, never give up. Never give up. And I said, you know what? And I was quite angry. I said, you know what? I'm going to do this. I don't care if you're not going to support me. I'm going to do it with or without you, you know? And he mm -hmm. turns to my mother and he said, Margaret, have a word, I think he's lost it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, gosh. Oh, wow. I, what said, you know what? I said, Dad, I, I, I'm just going to start. I've got to do this. I've got to start training. I've got to pro, you know, program myself for the next two years. And if I don't get there, well, at least I've tried. Mm. You know, at least I've tried. So I was very lucky with Neil Smith, uh, my coach at the time. You know, we worked out the plan you know, to get into the British team, because that's obviously the first protocol, is to get on the, the radar of British cycling, you know. So um, so I, I spent the whole year training. I lost two and a half stone in body weight. You know, I lost a lot of muscle and a lot of uh, a lot of training. Mm -hmm. And uh, another funny story I'll never forget. Um, 
one of the lead coaches for the paracycling team saying to Neil Smith, you know, where's this guy come from? Because he's pretty quick. You know, he's pretty powerful. And uh, Neil Smith said he's fell out of the sky. <laughs> yeah, true, yeah, which was true. Literally, yeah, literally. So, um, so at that point, you know, we're literally, um, well, two years after breaking my back, you know, I got selected by the British paracycling team. And I was, you know, I raced over the summer of 2011. They took me to five races with the help of Disability Sport Wales, and I came back with five medals. Mm. You know, so they're now thinking, hang on, we're one year from the games here, you know. Um, and then I, obviously, I got selected by um, the Paralympic Academy to obviously live and train, you know, full time in Manchester. Yeah. Uh, how my Sorry? How was that? Oh, well, think of it, as I just said, for 30 years, you know, I literally had this dream of being a professional athlete, you know, all through my schooling. I was okay. I was okay in school, you know. Um, I didn't leave school with A-levels and I didn't go to university, but sport was always my passion. You know, I was always good at sport. And, um, and then I literally, you know, arrived in Manchester with my bags, you know, after having a great work in life, you know, as, as, a, as an accounts manager, I love my job, I love sales and marketing and that was great, you know, and, and just having, I remember pulling up outside British Cycling in Manchester and just thinking, you know, even though my disability is never going to go away, I just felt so confident in myself that I'd waited all my life for this opportunity to turn up, you know, and I was just going to give it absolutely everything, you know. So I remember, you know, arriving in Manchester and obviously getting my supply of kit, you know, the jerseys and the fleece and the hoodies and, you know, all the other kit that you get. And, and it felt like Christmas Day. You know, I was 40, well, 41, 42 nearly, and just thinking, wow, you know, this, this dream is finally becoming a reality. Yeah. And, then, and then it all starts to make sense around being a professional athlete and how much responsibility you're given. You know, this is not just a bit of fun here. You know, this is a serious responsibility that you have when you're representing your country, you know, yeah. in any sport, you know, in any sport. So, so then I, I represented um, Great Britain then in the World Championships on the road in Denmark um, over the 10 mile time trial and I came back with a silver. Yeah. So this is one year away now from the Paralympics. So British Cycling are quite excited, thinking, mm -hmm. well, we've now picked up this guy and we're now going to, you know, get him into the best possible shape we can over the next, you know, 12 months. Yeah. And, uh, and they stripped another half a stone off me, you know. I, I don't know where it went, <laughs> <laughs> honestly. <laughs> it, was, it was a childhood dream, you know, it really was. Yeah. So, uh, so all your training, and then when you finally got to uh, the Paralympics, what was that like? Well, I think the, the the sad part in between was when I raced in Los Angeles for the World Track Championships. You know, literally five months after being selected for the Paralympic Academy. Um, unfortunately, we lost my dad to stomach cancer. So you can imagine. You know, I've gone into the World Championships as you know almost as a gold medal potential, and literally, I'd only been there four days, five days, and I knew my dad was really unwell, you know, obviously having this, this terrible illness, and seeing him before I went, you know, obviously we, we had a great day together, um, and he had jaundice, you know, he was in a terrible, terrible state at that point, but I genuinely thought that he would be okay when I came back, you know, I just thought, well, I'm away for literally a week, and, uh, and he, he would be, you know, there when I get back, but unfortunately, you know, literally four days after being out there, he passed away, um, which was a really sad time for me and my family. And my coach at the time, Tom Stanton, was, was fantastic. You know, Tom was very, very supporting. But I knew, you know, at the age of 42, I knew that it was my responsibility to race, you know, to win that world champion gold medal for my dad and for my country. Yeah. Um, and that's what I did the day after. You know, I literally rode on adrenaline, um, not so much anger because I'm not an angry person, but certainly, you know, I had fire in my belly. Yeah. And, um, and to win that world championship and bring that medal home, you know, was a, I don't know, just a great privilege, you know, it really was. So, yeah, it really was. Sometimes, but, you know, euphoric at, at the same time. So, yeah. yeah, such a such a proud moment. And like you said, 
something though that you, that your dad, you know, whatever you believe in, would have been looking upon you, just thinking, "Wow, that's my son." Oh, yeah. wow. um, I think you know, coming home and I suppose attending my dad's funeral, which was probably the worst day of my life, um, but. I kept thinking, you know, all of the messages that he's always given me, you know, that, okay, I suppose when you lose, um, when you lose a loved one, you know, that that's pretty tough, you know, to accept it and deal with it. But he prepared me, <coughs> excuse me, he prepared me all my life for that, mm. you know, just instilling into me that the process of, you know, obviously of passing away, we can't stop, you know, so don't be scared of it. You know, don't let it upset you and make you angry because we're, we're all going to go through the same process. Mm. You know, nobody's going to live forever. So nobody's, you know, an exception to the rule. And I think he prepared me, you know, for, uh, for that moment, you know, mm. all my life. And that's how I dealt with it. Mm. You know, that's how I dealt with it. Getting that phone call off my mother on the mm. Thursday and having to deal with it, you know, and then racing the next day and winning the Worlds. I still say to this day that he prepared me, you know, mentally for that, you know, all my life. So, so I feel, you know, I feel very privileged, you know, to, um, I guess, to have been his son. <laughs> yeah, and I'm sure he's felt very privileged to have you as his son, Mark, as well. Can I just ask you, for, for people, you know, that may think, right, I want to get to the Olympics, or that may be in a situation where they've had something... I'll say tragic, but it's been such a blessing to you. Happen. What advice would you give to them? Because that is such a powerful story um, that I, I think that would spur anybody on in life. Anybody. What advice would you give to them? I think the first bit of advice that I, I would give everybody is the advice my dad gave me. You know, is that you have to have a passion, whatever that passion is. Find something in your life that makes you happy. You know, and and stay positive. Because when you train the brain to be positive and be happy, which you can do, you know, because as, as I told you when I met you, you know, a few weeks ago, you know, we, we're born happy, yeah. you know, we're actually, as, as primates, you know, as human beings, we're born happy, but we choose to be unhappy. You know, I, I went from having a great job, company car, fantastic lifestyle to breaking my back and having nothing, absolutely nothing, penniless, you know. And yet, I still found it within my heart to be happy, even though I was angry, you know, at, at obviously what had happened, that, that was just the process I had to deal with. But I was still polite. I was still civil with people. You know, I was still nice to people. You know, I was, I was, not, um, I was not an unhappy, negative person, you know. So my first bit of advice would be, be you know, be, be positive, be happy, have a passion, and work towards your goals. You know, like I only had literally two years, you know, to get myself into the best shape possible and work towards the London Paralympics. Mm. And you have to try. That's the second thing I would say is have a go. You know, at least have a go and fail rather than not try and live with that, you know, disappointment for the rest of your life, knowing that you could have achieved something. You know, you could have achieved something. And, and don't be afraid, and this is what I say as a keynote speaker now, you know, don't be afraid to finish second, you know, as long as you give it 100%, yeah. you know, every time. You know, it's the fear of failure. We all have it as human beings, but don't be afraid to finish second as long as you give it 100%, whether that's your job, whether it's sport, whether it's a relationship, you know, work at it 100%. And don't be afraid to finish second, you know. The only time you should be scared of finishing second is if you don't give it 100%. And you only give it 99%. But you know in your heart that you didn't give it everything, you know. Because think about this, Karen. Sometimes the difference between silver and gold can be 1%. Yeah. You know? Yeah, very true. So is there any more Paralympics for you, Mark, or...? Oh, I know that you're a fantastic keynote, keynote speaker and that you're busy speaking, but is there any more Paralympics for you? Or? No, I think, the, um, I think the opportunity that London gave me, you know, to win two silver medals, one in the sprint, one in the 10-mile time trial, and then, you know, the, the euphoric feeling of breaking my world record on the day that I set it, 
in the three kilometer pursuit to win that gold medal in front of a home crowd you know there's nothing that's ever going to top that and I had literally nine stroke ten months you know in 2013 you know training and racing you know with with British cycling to almost to almost realize in my heart that I'd lived out my dream you know I'd lived out my childhood dream you know I, I, I was a world champion in my event you know, I was a world record holder in my event. I was a Paralympic gold medalist in my event, you know. So everything on my vision board, you know, I literally had ticked off. And then last year, you know, to be awarded the MBE by Prince Charles, that, that wasn't on my vision board, by the way. <laughs> you know, so... How did that happen? Um, it's quite a funny story as well around my mother because I received a letter from Buckingham Palace to say that I'd been awarded, you know, the MBE in the New Year's Honours list. And obviously I, I wasn't allowed to tell anybody because of, you know, the letter says do not disclose this letter to anyone. And uh, I remember my mother ringing me on the 1st of January when the New Year's Honours list was announced. And uh, my mother said, so why didn't you tell me? You know, why didn't you tell me when you received the letter? And I said, well, the, the letter arrived from the Queen and it said, you know, don't disclose this letter to anyone, you know. Yeah. And my mother sort of um, sort of said on the form of the deep voice, but I'm your mother. <laughs> <laughs> well, you can understand. You can understand. Yeah. So, yeah, so last year, obviously, I made the decision, you know, to retire from Paralympic sport, obviously on top, and, uh, and just felt that the opportunity that London gave me, I feel has turned into a responsibility now that I can share my key messages on life and help others, Karen, if I'm honest. You know, I love helping other people as a speaker. You know, I, I do lots of schools, you know, obviously speaking at schools, school visits, and obviously lots of charity work as well. Mm -hmm. And I feel that's been my calling, you know, for a long, long time. So I feel very privileged that, yes, you know, I, I went through hell and back. You know, I really did. And certainly shed, you know, lots of uh, blood, sweat, and certainly lots of tears. Yeah. To get to that point in my life where I feel very privileged, you know, very, very honoured to have this opportunity now to help, you know, literally thousands of people, you know, every year to change their life and, and live out their dream because, you know, another statement that my dad used to say when I was playing sport was, you know, winners never quit, Mark, and quitters never win, mm -hmm. you know. Yeah. Now, when I spoke to you um, when we were in Manchester filming, you said to me that there was a poem. Is it the man with the glass? The man in the glass. The man in the glass. And I think you knew it off by heart. Is that? I don't want to put you on the spot if you don't, but I read it and I thought it was very beautiful. And I could really understand where you came from and how you came to make your decision. Oh, yeah. So could you finish us off with that if you do know it off by heart? If not, no pressure. Yes, it, it got to the point last year as a speaker. You know, I was rehearsing this poem. And I literally stuck it on my office wall for probably six weeks. And every day doing my research as a keynote speaker, you know, and obviously doing my, my other business with the nutritional company. And, um, and, and I read it and read it and read it until it, it, made, it made me feel that, you know, not that, not that the poem actually belonged to me, but it was me, you know, and it was so poignant, you know. And I literally, I grabbed it off the wall and I sort of... <laughs> <laughs> and threw it in the bin. <laughs> so, so every day in the car, just reciting it, reciting it. And then I remember um, speaking for a, a large charity in the Celtic Manor in Newport. And that was the first time that I actually recited this poem. And I thought, well, if I can do it in front of 700 people, then, you know, it was the, it was the right decision. And, you know, so, yeah. yeah, I'm happy to recite it for you. Of course I am. Of course I am. Brilliant. So when you're ready... Okay, so this poem, this poem is called The Man in the Glass, and it was probably the, the, po the one poem that, that made my decision to retire from Paralympic sport and help, you know, other people. So, so here goes. Okay. When you get what you want in your struggle for self and the world makes you king for the day, just go to the mirror and look at yourself and see what the man has to say. For it isn't your father or mother or wife whose judgment upon you must pass. The fellow whose verdict counts most in your life is the one staring back from the glass. 
He's the fellow to please, never mind all the rest, for he's with you, clear to the end. And you've passed your most difficult, dangerous test if the man in the glass is your friend. You may fool the whole world down the pathways of yours and get pats on the back as you pass. But your final reward will be heartache and tears if you've cheated the man in the glass. Oh, Mark Colburn, MBE. Thank you ever so much. That was beautifully read. So if you ever fancy your chances as an actor, I think you I think you'll do I think you'll do very well, very well. And thank you very much for your time. I know you've made my heart sing tonight, Mark. You really have. You such an emotional story. Um, and I can imagine everybody who sits in front of you who is in your audience will feel inspired, uplifted. Uh, absolutely amazing. Thank you ever so much and thank you for your time. So if anybody does want to contact you, do you have, what's your website or your details or how do we contact you? And I will leave it at the bottom of this link as well. And if you'd yeah. like to call us and I'll leave it. Yeah, it's markcolburn.com. Markcolburn.com. Well, that's an easy one. Markcolburn.com. And thank you. So like I said, every single week we have somebody that's, you know, an everyday person but who has done something extraordinary and helps people do extraordinary things with their life. Life. So thank you very much, Mark, for your time. And thank you, everybody else, for watching. I know we've had viewers linking uh, in and out of this. So as you can say, Mark Kohlberg, MBE, has been an absolute star. And thank you for another date with the Dream Alchemist.